Uh, my name is Jesse Teitelbaum, and I am sitting here with Representative Richard Geist, Republican from the 79th District in Blair County, who served from 1979 to 2012. Thank you for being with me today. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'd like to start out by asking you about your background. Tell me about your, your early life and your early education. I was born and raised on a little small farm in Allegheny Township outside the city of Altoona. Uh, I went to a one-room grade school, which I proudly have up in my office, a Joe Cervallo print, and uh, went on to the Altoona School District, uh, Roosevelt Junior High School. And we had our choice then of either going to Haldysburg or Altoona because the township was very small. I mean, they paid uh, whatever money we had to pay to the district to do that. And because there was a shop bus that ran by our farm, I, I was able to go to school in, the, in a blue and white bus with the shop guys. And uh, it, was, it turned out to be pretty good. I, my first time ever ran for office was eighth grade in Roosevelt. I went from a class of about 36 students in the whole one-room school to 1,500 kids in a big junior high school and ended up being uh, all, all school vice president in eighth grade. And, uh, Next time I ran for office was to run for the state house. I never set out to be in elected office. Nothing in college. Well, no, I never ran for anything. I, I went to, I went back to the Altoona campus. Uh, I was in the uh, two-year engineering program because it wasn't four-year then, mm -hmm. and um, worked a couple different jobs. I used to uh, work for Ansley and Lewis, and I would go to Pittsburgh and four o'clock in the morning with a Volvo 544 and hook it up and tow it back uh, to the district uh, and then go to to the campus to school and um, you know it just it's pretty amazing to uh, turn this thing off it's pretty amazing that when you uh, uh, you have all that energy you know yeah you get up early you work go to class then work at a gas station in the evening and uh, still have time to pursue a social life and you don't even think anything about it you just do it yeah so when i graduated uh, from penn state i went to work for amp engineering in pittsburgh designing emp stores because my father had been with amp okay as a supervisor in the bakery and uh, i i went in there you know probably ahead of the whole curve for uh, anybody and we had 660 some stores in the central division and uh, I worked there uh, for a while and then uh, uncle I got a pre letter from the president of the United States inviting me for an all-expense paid tour of Southeast Asia and uh, <laughs> so I uh, went home and uh, uh, it didn't work out going in because I, I, I actually enlisted and um, I was walk I had taken another job with the Atlantic Richfield uh, designing mini marts before they, but even oh. they, they weren't even popular. Then they were going to a concept of putting uh, convenience stores in gas stations. And uh, my training with EMP made me very valuable. Yeah. Um, but I was walking down the street in Altoona, and I saw the Gwynn Engineer sign, and it was uh, three o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and I was moving on Monday back to Pittsburgh, and uh, I went in and talked to them, and they made me an offer. And, that's you know those hinges of history yeah. other than that I wouldn't have stayed in Altoona right and uh, my dad was very ill had been ill for a long time and and I came home and Roy lived lived with my mom and dad and tried to help take care of things and um, started out uh, as a structural designer for uh, Gwynn engineers yeah. which later became Eads and I worked my way up through the company. I had, I think in uh, 11 or 12 years, I had 11 or 12 different titles. Um, and I was a Kellogg Fellow in the Public Affairs Leadership Program and finished up that whole thing. And then uh, Cliff Jones and some other people decided I should run for the State House, and I, I turned it down. Two and a half terms later, they came after me again, and we said yes, and the rest is history. I got real lucky. and. Uh, won an election, had no idea what I was doing, <laughs> no clue. Nice. What would you say would be your influences in shaping you to become a Republican? Uh, my grandparents were uh, both active in, in the city, in the 8th Ward, my, my mom's side, uh, and they were real active in the Republican Party. Uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad 
uh, they wanted their their people and to be Republican and and had influence, and so it just came downhill to me. I mean, I I never was anything else but. Um, um, you said that after a, um, you were approached first to to run for the state house, declined, and then ran a few years later. Yeah, the same Cliff Jones and the same group of people, Stan Over, uh, who was the president of our company, and uh, they were going to try really hard to elect Dick Thornburg, and they wanted to build roads and fix broken roads and bridges. And with my background, I became a pretty good choice. And, uh, was very lucky and won by 586 votes and was a freshman member of the Transportation Committee. And, uh, Rudy Denini was a wonderful chairman and took me under his wing. And uh, Next thing you know, I'm attending uh, all the State Transportation Commission meetings and carrying Rudy's vote. Never once did anybody ever tell me how to vote, not once. Good. And uh, that, that was a wonderful learning experience for me. So. Uh, Do you remember the first campaign? I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, Very different than subsequent campaigns? Well, it's totally different because, you know, you, you've got to sell yourself. Yeah. And uh, I knocked on 10,800 doors where there were people home, 3,800 where they weren't, and then I went back and saw every one of those. Wow. And uh, wore out a couple pair of shoes. And, uh, everything else, I got really fortunate. I wouldn't say that I really won. I would actually say that, um, the guy that was there before lost. It was a combination of a lot of things. And it was a good Republican year. Did you enjoy campaigning? Mm, I enjoyed the people part of it. I really hate the backwater of politics. Okay. I mean, I, I think it's ugly. Uh, it's really mean. and. Uh, and I just don't like it at all. And I can tell you that in my career, I've never been a political knife fighter. I've never attacked members of city council or the county commissioners and uh, other local elected folks. I mean, I've, I've, uh, I've listened while they've attacked Harrisburg and find it kind of humorous. But, uh, you know, it's, no, it's, it's, it's been my style. Can you describe for me the 79th district, um, both in geography <laughs> and the makeup of people? Well, first of all, it's, I just went through my 4-3 districting. Oh, okay. So when I first started, it was not the whole city at all. Uh, the Juniata section wasn't part of my district. And uh, so I served at, uh, it had a real tendency to lean Democratic. Uh, and I was a, a Republican and very lucky to, to win the seat. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the next reapportionment brought in Juniata and one small sliver of Logan Township. And then the next redistricting brought in all of Logan Township and one uh, little wee piece of Allegheny Township. And uh, this redistricting made it uh, a really good Republican seat because all of Allegheny Township will be in it except the foot of 10 section. So it's, uh, it's been ever changing since I came in. The demographic of the, cha the city has changed immensely. I believe when I first got elected, there were 3,500 pe or 6,500 people working in railroading, wow. and today there's about a thousand. Huh. Uh, the the manufacturing base was really really good in Altoona, and that's basically really gone away. Huh. And so I was really active in industrial development and doing those kind of things. And, um, so would you say that railroading and other um, blue-collar ideas were, were the main issues of, of the people in the district? I, th I think the district is very conservative and it has a very, very um, ethnic uh, work ethic. Okay. And it's a wonderful, wonderful district. Yeah. What were some of the major projects that you were able to help bring into the district during your time in the House? I've been able to deliver hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of checks and projects. And that's my job, to represent my district. And uh, it all started my freshman term when uh, we were trying to get track credits because Conrail had just been formed out of the bankrupt railroads. And uh, the main line of the railroad, which runs through Altoona and Harrisburg here, uh, was not in good shape. It needed a tremendous amount of maintenance. And we were deeply involved with legislation that would allow them to have state tax credits if they put that money back in the rail. Okay. And uh, that was such a hotly contested issue that it went to a conference committee. And uh, 
it was 2-2. Two, two. Got four votes, which we needed. Uh, and then it was uh, approved by the House and Senate. And that was a, a real boon for my district because I think the first year Conrail put an additional $59 million in track work and the next year was $150 million and wow. it went on from there and uh, that became a, a wonderful thing for the district. First term uh, I was able to uh, be instrumental in, in delivering uh, the first piece of I-99 which was actually built just outside of the city. We had no money and it was just a half of a section but it was symbolic of what was to come. and. Uh, so as a freshman, I was making all the tough votes for Thornburg and uh, uh, translated that into concrete. Yeah. You've had a uh, district office the entire time? I've had a district office since day one. Okay. First one was a volunteer office. It was in the engineering company. And a wonderful lady named Myrna Green, um, who grew up with my older sister, and uh, a wonderful lady, and we had uh, we had a tremendous amount of walk-in business. It was unbelievable, and uh, the need was great. Okay. And that that expanded to where, um, when I retired here, here we had uh, uh, five full-time people and two part-time people. We could have used two more full-time people. Really? Constituent work is that big, and there's that many problems, and uh, it's a shame, but it it happens. Whether it's PennDOT or Department of Revenue or I mean, the stuff that we unravel, and our people became really, really good at unraveling problems and solving them. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. So district offices and having office hours um, is quite important within the district. I think it's an absolute must, and I know that there's people who trans or campaign against it now and say that it's a total waste of state dollars and, uh, you know, with the Internet, people can do anything. Well, that's absolutely false. Uh, and uh, I will tell you, it's a people business, and you're in the people business. And if you can't service them and solve their problems, then you're not doing your job. And, and by golly, I will tell you, the, the legitimacy is out of sight. Yeah. I think one of, the, uh, one of the things that kept coming out when we were conducting research on your district was the <coughs> tour to Tuna that you had started, and unfortunately it's not going to be... Uh, yeah, it's done. Anymore, but it's, it's done now, unless okay. somebody revives it. Right. Um, I got into the bicycling because I crashed an ultralight and I was almost killed. And uh, I had my right knee snapped off and both cruciates rebuilt and an aviator's fracture of the right ankle. and uh, My right hand was torn off and rebuilt and a bunch of other injuries. and. Uh, I spent uh, a lot of time in a wheelchair and then on Canadian crutches that I couldn't even hold on to. I was strapped into and uh, I started riding uh, in therapy a Fitron bicycle which you pump oil and it can change the length of the crank arm. So I, I, my right knee was in a cast for a year and then had to be broken a little bit at a time and um, it's pain you can never describe. So uh, I was bound and determined I was going to walk again. So. Uh, I had a wonderful physical therapist named Linda Dunmeyer, and uh, I would do anything for her in the world I could, but she was amazing, and uh, I was uh, was walking, uh, of, you know, with a plat one platform crutch, and then later, like, with a hopping along, and I would ride my the bicycle every day, and finally, uh, I bought a touring bike, for the, a nice touring bike for out in the street. And my good friend Baron DeShong, who were still best buddies, and uh, I started riding and uh, uh, obsessively. Uh, and you know, they would say ride for half an hour, and I go out and ride four hours. Uh, and I entered my first bicycle race, and I finished fourth in my age group. And I was just so impressed with that. I mean, it was amazing. And at the award ceremonies, uh, I found out that the th three guys who had beaten me all were recovering from heart attacks. So, you know, I was really proud to be able to race, proud to finish. And uh, a couple of those guys became very good friends. But uh, uh, it, it's amazing what the human body can do if you push it to recover. And I'm, I'm obsessively nuts. 
<laughs> so well, when I crashed, when I crashed two weeks before I crashed, I just found a medal in the back of my desk, and I, I had been a competitive weightlifter, and um, they had a fundraiser for the high school football team. It was an open bench press contest, and I'd benched 370 pounds wow. in that contest at 181 pound body weight, and uh, um, you know, two weeks later, I'm fighting for my life in Duke Hospital. So, I mean, it's kind of really weird. But I have no idea how that metal got in, you know, it, but it had been in my desk for as long as I've been here. So. <laughs> Just uh, showed yeah. up, yeah. Um, I'd like to go now to... Um, Would well, you want to finish the Oh, yes, I'm sorry, please. Um, there was a city councilman named Carl King who had a, was retired, and um, a guy that had an insurance agency down, downtown um, really good guys, and Carl wanted to do something in the dog days of August, because you could fire a 30 out six down the main street of Altoona, you never had to worry about hitting anybody. <laughs> and uh, we came up with this idea to have a bicycle race. None of us knew anything about a bicycle race, especially putting one on. So uh, we raised a little money, I raised the money, and uh, we had a race, and if I remember right, about 80 people came. We raced men and women together and uh, paid out the money. And, uh, and we thought, hey, this is a pretty good idea. So the next year we did the same thing, and I went after sponsors. Okay. And we did very well. I mean, when you're passionate about something, it's not hard. And uh, we ended up having the biggest race cash-wise in Pennsylvania. And uh, wonderful race. We, we split men and women, and, and uh, it went extremely well downtown. The United States Cycling Federation, on the other hand, did not like the fact that an unsanctioned race was doing that. Because we had no sanctioning or nothing else. And uh, so they uh, gave uh, people that won money in Altoona a very hard time with their license. Uh, okay. And they said to us that we couldn't do that anymore and we couldn't do that. And I said, well, we'll have the race anyhow, but we'll make the checks payable to John Doe. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. So. We, we, we had back and forth, and uh, we went down and met with the United States Cycling Federation in Reading, Pennsylvania, and uh, we thought, okay, we'll do a sanctioned event, and, uh, and I wanted to grow it. I, I thought we really had a home run based upon who was coming to race and from where, and uh, we had a, a wonderful lady named Lisa Voigt, and that would be the actor John Voigt's niece. And uh, her dad was a professor at Penn State, but she was worked in Colorado. And uh, I loved working uh, with Lisa, and uh, uh, we we built the race into the Tour de Tuna stage race. Now it's a little bit of humor here. Uh, I'm a fairly conservative Republican, and we wanted to grow the race big. And there were a lot of men's races in America, a tremendous amount. There were next to nothing for women. I mean, next to nothing. And I said, look, you know, everybody in our family was an, an athlete, and the, all the women played basketball and stuff, and not the three-on-three three and over the line. They played men's rules. Same court. Tennis was the same. And uh, my premise was I, women could race the same course as the men. I didn't care if it took them a day. And... Uh, it was, it was really funny they, uh, how it all came about. The rule book said that they were limited in distance and climbing, how many vertical feet of climbing they could do. And I said, this is BS, because a lot of women I ride with can drop me anytime. <laughs> and uh, so we went ahead and planned that we would be the first race in America, big race, with equal purses. Well, the racers, the men racers, didn't like it at all. And uh, they had some choice words for me. And I, I can remember telling one of the biggest names in the sport, hey, people get paid millions of dollars to lobby me. You're not, it's not going to work coming from an amateur like you. And, uh, and we, were really in, we were really between a rock and a hard place because we needed uh, the, the Federation officials to do the race. And, the, and if we were breaking the rules, they couldn't do the race. So we were at a, what they call a Mexican standoff, right? And uh, Jerry Lace was head of the, at that time was head of the United States Cycling Federation and a wonderful guy. And I called Jerry up in the morning. I said, Jerry, I want you to know that I'm going to do a press uh, conference and a press release this afternoon uh, talking about us having all this money for equal for women and that you guys are, you know, putting us out of business. 
So I said, you might as well get ready for all the calls because you, you're not going to be popular. And uh, he called me back in about 20 minutes and he said, we're going to look the other way. Go ahead and have your race. So we, we, we raced women and, and, and they did a fantastic job. They were wonderful. Uh, we, we had a super field. We had uh, the very best women of Canada and, and the United States. We had some Australians and a lot of New Zealanders. We, we started building international fields, which then changed the, the name of the race to the International Tour de Tuna. And uh, we built it to a seven-day event, stage race. Uh, the biggest, it was actually the biggest stage race in the world for women for three years. And we had all the professional men. Every guy that raced at the Tour de France raced our race. Uh, mm -hmm. All the Olympic medal winners raced our race. And, and uh, in 92, we did the U.S. National Championships and Olympic trials uh, at the request of the Federation. And uh, we had a great Olympic trial, and we had the Jaffa Mosque, and the whole town got into it. We were probably the smallest community uh, to ever do this. Uh, we had beaten out 17 communities that went after it. Uh, Spokane had had it to, for two Olympics before us. The Utah Sports Foundation, which put on the Olympics, hmm. uh, and Columbus, Ohio, which had a really large cycling community with a lot of wealth. It, and there's seven in the community. It got narrowed down to the four of us. And I had a campaign slogan: uh, "Too off and too high, too flat." And uh, we, uh, we, I think there were 44 votes. We got 43 and a half to put the event on, because everybody had raced toward a tuna and they knew what we did. And uh, the trials went off. Uh, they went off great. Uh, we had an Olympic ball with black tie. We put all the winners in tuxes and. Uh, it was just fabulous. It was great for the town. Sure. Um, and that that kind of uh, coming from Western Pennsylvania, uh, people in sports are revered. High school sports are used. Uh, when I was in high school, there was nothing bigger than uh, our football team. Uh, you know, our our city would put about eleven thousand, twelve thousand people in the stands for every high school game. And we played the unbelievable schedule. And we lost one game in three years when I was in school. And that was the little Indiana. And they had three guys in the backfield that when all, all three of them went on to be all American uh, uh, fullbacks. So, you know, not, nothing uh, that people understand it, that when you have a community that has that kind of mentality, they embrace athletes. Uh, my biggest worry was could you embrace an athlete that didn't have a sport with a ball attached to it? And uh, the answer was yes. And uh, uh, I still hear from so many of those uh, those people who raced. And uh, when we were doing the Olympics and uh, Olympic trials, we had uh, Linda Brenneman who came in to do commercials. And she looked like she came from Central Casting. A beautiful gal, wonderful personality, and a whale of a bike rider. And uh, one year I had Rolex as a sponsor, and they gave a, a big time watch for the Saturday road race after 100 miles. and she came across the finish line. Instead of throwing her arms up, she was going like this, pointing <laughs> to her wrist. And we had uh, Lance Armstrong, um, who was very difficult to work with, but an athlete then, it was just, he was a phenomenal athlete. Mm -hmm. um, Darren Baker was a Pennsylvania guy from Chambersburg, a professional rider, went on to be great as a professional, and Bobby Julik. And uh, Bobby Julik is just one of the nicest guys God ever put on earth. And, um, when he came in, uh, you know, these are funny stories, but, but uh, Bobby, they, they told me from the Federation, now Rick, you know, he doesn't talk much. He's real quiet and he's shy. And, and uh, we had all these guys in their Olympic sweats and all that kind of stuff. And they're good looking kids, right? And we had, uh, I had Bobby up at Keith Junior High School and there's three sections of the auditorium and they had it filled, seventh, eighth, and ninth graders. Wow. And uh, I had Bobby Julik out there leading cheers with these section, USA, US. We had those kids so fired up, but um, school was a wreck the rest of the day. And uh, one quick funny story is uh, my cousin's daughter, who was in eighth grade, she and her girlfriends fell in love with Bobby Julik. And they were, they, were, uh, they were just all over me about Bobby Julik this, Bobby Julik that. And uh, I was kidding about having all those groupies. And so my 
cousin's daughter called me and she said, is there anything we can do? We want to do something, all of us. I said, okay. I said, now you can prepare for this. You know that all those guy racers, they shave the hair off their legs. And uh, be, be, not for aerodynamics, but, you know, so the, the road rash heals much better. But, and I said, well, I said, maybe you guys could be the, the leg shaving group. <laughs> and she was convinced that they were going to shave Bobby Joyk's legs. So about a week later, I, they were asking me what kind of razors to buy and all this stuff. I said, I don't know. I mean, I'm, you're going to have to ask your moms and stuff. So about a week later, her mother called me and said, you've got to stop this. You have got to stop this. She said, they believed you. And uh, so I had to tell them that they couldn't do it. They weren't of age. And, uh, you know, to this day, she now has kids of her own and everything. And she still busts me about shaving Bobby <laughs> Jolik's legs. But we have wonderful times. We do wonderful crowds. We have, uh, we hosted people from all over the world. We, we had great cooperation from every governor that was that was involved. And, I got Governor Ridge out riding a bicycle and campaigning on one, and uh, we went all over the state together, which started the Ridge rides. Oh yes. Yeah, we, we, it was a it was a wonderful time, and uh, I'm, I'm I hope that somebody else comes along and young and steps up and wants to work every weekend and every available hour to to package something like this because it's good for the state, it's good for the country, and uh, it brings a lot of tourism money in. I was going to say, I'm sure it probably brings in a lot of, a lot of money for the, the tourism, especially in the area. Well, it did, and we had surveys, and we had Penn State do surveys, and you know, we kind of knew. We, you, you don't sell a ticket, so you had to be able to survey in different ways. And I was always in the, the media van in front of the race, and I would always look at license plates, and then I would look if it was a Pennsylvania plate, if they had a car dealer okay. identification on it. So we knew that we had uh, a huge percentage of our people that came from Virginia, Maryland, New York, New Jersey, and they would come and they, they stay a week. And where they stayed, you don't know, mm -hmm. but you know, you see them every day and you know that they're spending money. So Penn State came up with a formula for how much they spent and, and all that. And I think the lowest was four million, and that's a lot of money in an area like ours. Thing. And you know what's nice about that money? It stays. Mm -hmm. You don't have to educate your kids, nothing else like that, and that money circulates in the community. Yeah. And uh, that's, I was, ch I chaired the Tourism, um, Recreation and Industrial Development Subcommittee on Department and Commerce Committee when I first came, so I had a good idea what we were doing there. Yeah. Great. Great project, too. Oh, it's wonderful. Wonderful. Um, let's go back to your first term. Oh, um, remember it like yesterday. What were your first impressions of, of, of day one, your swearing in? Well, my, my, my impressions go back just a little bit before that. Um, we had uh, some seminars for newly elected guys, and you know, we got preached to a lot. And I was assigned a mentor, Harry Biddle, just a wonderful guy, and I had him here for my going away speech. And Sam Hayes, of course, took me under his wing when Sam was in leadership. And I, I had a, a moving experience. It was, uh, I came down to Harrisburg for one of those meetings and it was over and I went up the back steps into the floor of the house. Now there weren't guards, everything wasn't locked up then. You could have stolen the Capitol and nobody would have cared. <laughs> and uh, I sat back on the Democratic side in the back row and it was just getting dusk and the light was coming through the stained glass windows and that room is immense. And I, and I was sitting up there, and I really had one of those moving moments. And, uh, you know, you got elected to govern. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm sitting here thinking, you know, my whole life was centered around a campaign, which you're so involved with, and now you're charged with a mission. And uh, I thought, wow, you better really learn what you're doing. And that's when the engineering mind kicked in. And uh, I must have sat up there for an hour and meditated. I mean, about what did I really get myself into? Uh, I mean, do I, did I, should I quit and not get sworn in? Or, you know, how do, how do you cope? And there were some really big names in the house then. And, and how do you get along? And I just figured my vote counted the same as anybody else's vote, and I'd do the best I could with it. And uh, I was bound and determined to work as hard or harder than anybody had ever served. Mm -hmm. And I tried to do that. So it was days and days and days of, of prep. 
I read every book I could get my hands on on Ben Franklin before I came in because I wanted to understand the concept. The concept of representative government is kind of unique. The General Assembly of Pennsylvania is very unique all over the world. And so I really um, studied and I wanted to find out how do you reach consensus? Well, there was no formula, there were no books on it, none. I mean, there, there was all kind of stuff on how a bill becomes law, right? <laughs> But there was nothing that filled in the blanks. Oh. And um, so I, I took a crash course and spent as much time as I could talking to the guys that sat around me. Uh, Warren Spencer was chairman of judiciary then, and he had been all shot up in World War II. And what a wonderful guy. And, and our current speaker's dad was uh, mm -hmm. Snuffy Smith, and he had flown bombers over Europe in World War II. And, survived all of his missions and he was chairman of business and commerce and I was on business and commerce and I would pick these guys brains every day and uh, uh, Nick Mallman was from uh, Lebanon County and uh, a Yale Law School graduate and just one of the nicest and best guys I ever met. Uh, the General Assembly was really different then than it is today and uh, I, I will tell you it was vastly different uh -huh. and uh, so I, I learned as much as I could and I really got wrapped up and I, I was really anxious to get into business of writing and creating law. Now why you do that, you have to be a little nuts, uh, but I did it and I, that was my favorite part in 34 years was creating, creating good law. Right. Um, you had served on various committees um, during the time that you were in the House. Um, probably the one that, that comes to mind when, when your name is said is the Transportation Committee. I started out on transportation. I came out of the industry when I came in. And uh, man, I thought I knew a lot about transportation until I got on the committee and I started realizing the politics of transportation and the politics of all the modalities. And uh, it was, uh, once again, an unbelievable learning experience for me. And I had wonderful people to work with and good resources, I will tell you this. And uh, once again, I wanted to be the very best ever in transportation. And uh, that, that took hours and hours and hours. And I, I think the very first bill that I worked on was the uh, legislation on the tax credits for Conrail. Right. And uh, the, the working, uh, working on that and, and um, just about, I, I think I wrote 23 amendments and uh, one of the bills for trucking, uh, including a triaxle to, the triaxle is a workhorse out where I live. Okay. And uh, there was, there was a, a bunch of regulations that were being promulgated uh, to reduce their capacity to 58,000 pounds and limit the weight by axles in the front axle. And um, we took them all on and actually won on the floor. Really? Yeah, and that's, it was, that was a, my first floor debate really and it was very interesting because it had nothing to do with pure logic once again it had to do with what we had to do to re to get 102 votes yeah and uh, I learned a lesson from Sam Hayes then that if you have the votes keep your mouth shut and that's served me well for a lot of years now with regards to committees when you're a freshman um, are you assigned committees or do you get to, to well, choose with your interests? Later in life, I had the pleasure of being chairman of the Committee on Committees, which assigns people to okay. committees. And uh, I know that leadership had an awful lot to do with me as a freshman uh, putting me on business and commerce and transportation. Uh -huh. uh, they were the committees that could really help my, my distressed district. When I came in here, do uh, you remember the misery index? That was the total of the unemployment percentage and the inflation number. Well, the misery index at Altoona was horrible. Uh. And, uh, and they, they were the best committees that I could serve on. And you know, w we had third committee, they stuck me on urban affairs and I felt like I was in Philadelphia, not Altoona. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I had, uh, I had uh, wonderful committees and had good chairmen, good mentors. And uh, I, I will tell you, it made my freshman term much easier. Yeah. Now, I almost didn't run for a second term. Oh, really? No, this is a strange story, but um, I took a real big cut in pay to come here. And uh, my wife was teaching third grade. And, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we lived a brother in lifestyle, no debt, you know, that, that whole business. And, 
and I really had been thinking about and about you know okay I said I would run I won and I was going to leave but we had 102 votes oh, yeah. so when I broached that with leadership they didn't like that idea at all to put it mildly they were not happy uh, because I have a district that's really very hard to keep sure it's not a Republican seat and all that kind of stuff so um, they had a meeting down in the, the speaker's office and and uh, I went down and uh, I, I told them all why I was not going to run again. And the, put it mildly in a lot less four-letter words, um, they said, you have to run. We want to control the majority. You have to run. You have to hold that seat. And I said, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> and it came around and they, they said, well, what would it take to hold your seat? And off the top of my head, I ticked off a whole long list of things that would have to be done. And uh, we were in a little office down in the basement, and there were eight of us in there, very small room, very small. And uh, there were two senior members in there, Tony Semini and Bill Mikowski. And Bill and I became very good friends and office mates later. And uh, Matt Ryan came in uh, with his Irish up. And he told everybody in the office, he said, you guys get the hell out of here. I got to talk to Rick in private. And I thought, oh, this is worse than going to the principal's <laughs> office. The principal came to me. And uh, he pulled a chair up and came back and he said, you can't, you can't, you can't quit. You've got to run. And I said, Matt, I, you know, I, I've served my time. I, you know, I wanted to get out of here. So he, he uh, pulled a piece of paper out of his pocket and handed it to me and he said, are all these the things that you need to get reelected in that district? And I said, well, if I had them all, yeah. And uh, he said, well, the governor and everybody's decided and all the powers to be that these things will all be done. Now, I, I wasn't negotiating. I will tell you flat out, there was no way I was negotiating. I mean, I was too honest about it. If I was negotiating, they probably would have caught on. And uh, the question was, if we do all this, will you run again? And I said, well, I'd have to, because these are just wonderful things for the city of Altoona. And, uh, and by golly, uh, Governor Thornburg, and, who was an excellent governor, he's wonderful to work with, uh, they made it all happen. And uh, I, I ran, I knew I would be targeted, and uh, it was a, uh, another brutal race, almost uh, bare knuckle politics, full contact. And uh, I was lucky and won by 5,800 votes. Wow. And, uh, and, and that was really pleasing because we, we just really worked. I mean, it was 60, 70, 80 hours a week, sure. and it was always that the whole time I was here. Um, that, uh, th that was humbling, right? But the salary then was $18,720, and uh, it was not exactly a poor man's sport. And one of the things that you see going on now is uh, a move to make it uh, be the sandbox of the rich again, or the special interest. And I, I really don't like that at all. I don't, I don't think that's really what Franklin and those guys had in mind when they set up representative government. Sure. And uh, I, could, I could do an hour lecture on that for you. The, uh, when I almost died in the... the uh, I was learning to fly an ultralight, and I was going to buy one, and I was, I was almost killed in Edenton, North Carolina, and uh, thank God they had a, a wonderful stabilization there and took me to Elizabeth City, and you know, they, you know, doctors don't like to lose battles, so they flew me over to Duke on a Coast Guard helicopter, and, and uh, I spent uh, a wonderful month at Duke and, uh, in, in traction, and uh, not knowing whether I was going to lose my right hand or, or uh, I went through many, many surgeries. And wonderful guys. I, I, mean, I became very good friends with my doctors and therapists and, and others. And um, While I was laying in that bed, um, the, Terry Sanford was the head of Duke at that time. And he had one of his guys who was a, a neat old guy. And he would come every day with my mail and all that stuff because I was getting all this stuff from Pennsylvania and, and media requests and all that, and, and I don't think anybody had any idea how bad a shape I was in. They, they kind of withheld information. Right. And the uh, best thing I got was the 
cherry chocolate cake from a, a restaurant here in Harrisburg that we frequented every day for lunch. And uh, that was just absolutely wonderful. And, you know, to this day, there's nobody that could bake a cake like Faye Nicholas. But it was, it was what, laying in that bed, I don't know whether it was uh, induced uh, by all the drugs I was taking or what. And, and, and I came up with a, an idea about creating wealth. And how do you go about creating wealth? How do you go about creating uh, real technology jobs? And how do you go about saving manufacturing jobs with, with advanced technology? And uh, I, at that time, I had been investing in a lot of technology companies and, and doing very well, by the way. And uh, so this idea came to me, and I, and I broached it. At that time, I was on the Millwright Council, Make Industry and Labor Right in Today's Economy. And there were five labor leaders, five leaders of business, and a member of each caucus, and the governor. And uh, I had this, this I, I thought it was a really good idea. I mean, I was really convinced, and when you're laying there and you have nothing else to do, I mean, I worked a whole compound matrix out on it and how to make it work. And uh, <laughs> I came home, I was in a wheelchair, and I, I remember meeting uh, with uh, the Cliff Jones and Bobby McIntyre. And Bob McIntyre is one of my heroes in government. He was uh, the vice chairman of the AFL-CIO, and uh, he was an IBEW guy. And, and uh, at that time, I wasn't exactly the union's favorite. So we, uh, I, I went over my idea with them and, uh, and, uh, and talked about uh, creating the Advanced Technology Job Creation Act. Now, if you remember how bad our economy was then, uh, the idea that you would do a bill to create wealth uh, was so oxymoronish when government was about creating jobs in the end, we only had worn out brooms. And uh, we brought it to a full millwright council, and Tom Murphy was a House Democrat, and, I, and Tom Murphy and I have a claim to fame. We never lost a bill we put up together, never. Murphy went on to be three-time mayor of Pittsburgh, yeah. and uh, I spent 34 years here, so it was pretty odd that the two of us would, would do that. We did a lot of stuff in housing also. But they, they, they really liked the concept. Uh, we wrote it up, and um, only two names on the bill, so you know it was not the greatest, uh, <laughs> greatest idea when people didn't jump on. And it was Tom Murphy and I. Yeah. And uh, the bill passed, and we got up and running. And Governor Thornburg, bless his heart, came up with a much better name called the Ben Franklin Partnership. And uh, that's been a staple. It's been copied by about every state in the country. Wow. And uh, it's created thousands, I mean thousands, of high-paying technology jobs across the state. And uh, you know, if you have a crowning achievement, one of them, that would be it. And I, at the 25th anniversary, they, uh, they honored uh, myself, Dick Thornburg, and Walt Placilla, Dr. Placilla, who went down to set the same thing up in Virginia. And I got to meet a lot of the people whose deals I had read who went on to build companies and sell them and you know all what capitalism is about truly and uh, that made you, made you feel really good sure. and uh, a, a lot of that took place in Blair County and Penn State be, uh, became a leader in it they didn't uh, they didn't come embracing it there was a little battle at the beginning and, and once again Bob McIntyre uh, and Cliff Jones two of my all-time heroes when Penn State didn't really get on board and there was not a great deal of happiness with them. Uh, Bryce Jordan had just taken over as president, and they requested he come down and meet with the Millwright Council. And he came down, he didn't bring any aides. He came himself, and he came in and with his Texas accent, and he said, now boys, he said, I know I got problems. And he said, I know how to fix them. He said, you just give me a chance, and we'll be the best at this. And he went home, and. Uh, at that time, they had written articles in the Center Daily Times because I was talking about uh, an industrial park, research park at Penn State, and they thought I was absolutely nuts. And uh, they were looking for a tall tree and a short rope. And, you know, Innovation Park started after that with Bryce Jordan, and, uh, and the rest is history. Right. Some of the best startup companies uh, and ideas have been spun out of ideas that were at Penn State. And uh, I just hope that that continues and gets bigger and bigger. 
So, I mean, those are the kind of things I got deeply involved with. And, and you know, after I came back, I spent a lot of time in a wheelchair and then on crutches for a long time. That's how I got into bicycling, of course. And uh, well, the, the entire time that you were recuperating, you didn't change your mind and say, I, I'm done, I, I'm no, not going to I, I, I had, I had a, uh, I don't know what kind of spirit you would call it. I really wanted to walk again and walk without a limp. And I had one therapist who gave up on me, and I hadn't given up on myself. And uh, so I met with the head of uh, the, the hospital, and, and I said, I would like to be the person that says I can't do it anymore, not somebody else. Yeah. You know. And when I know down in here I can't do it, I'll tell you. And uh, I mentioned her before. I started working with Linda. And I said, give me somebody tough, and boy, they gave me the toughest. She should have been a Marine drill, drill sergeant, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, we have a, uh, had a good relationship, and uh, I, th I thank God for that. Good. And uh, so I, I push myself, just like I did on the job. I, I, I push myself extremely hard uh, when it comes to stuff like that. Sure. And you've always wanted to come back to the house when you were... Yeah, I, I fell in love with the house. I, I've had opportunities. I got, uh, I got recruited to run for Congress a couple of different times, even from the top leadership. I wouldn't run against Bud Schuster. Uh, I was recruited to run against my senator, and he was in leadership, and I wouldn't do that. And uh, so I just decided I'd make the best career I could in the House. During the time that you were here, um, you had sponsored numerous bills. Hundreds. Um, yeah. Um, 23, 24 of them became acts. Um, a lot of them dealing with transportation issues and, right. and highways. Um, if you had to pick the top one, two, three acts um, that you're most proud of? Well, one bill for sure that everybody in Pennsylvania loves, and I have no idea that it was mine, is the automatic shutoff at the sheet store. Uh, I wrote the legislation that created that. Um, no, I, 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 would, I would think that, that when you look back at it, there, there are a whole lot of them, but there are a couple of them that really saved a lot of lives that were really really in the public's interest. Teenage driving, uh, the bill that we passed there was, was not a popular subject. Uh, having parents and guardians be responsible for somebody for 50 hours, it wasn't a, it wasn't a big con, you know, wasn't, you know. And my, one of my arguments on the floor, would you rather spend 50 hours with a kid or be a Paul Bear? Because uh, we were just killing teenagers like you couldn't believe in Pennsylvania. And uh, we've modified that bill. Uh, Catherine Watson took it over after you know, a while. It became hers. And um, there are thousands and thousands of teenagers in Pennsylvania who were alive now uh, or, or, or not maimed because of that legislation mm -hmm. and the training that they got. We want them to be competent drivers. Right. You know, in all the hearings that we had on those bills, you know who the toughest was on kids? Who the what group testified? Other kids. Really? Yeah, they knew. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had told us then that the, the dollar punishments weren't anything but taking away somebody's driver's license. That's a terrible punishment. Well, it was when I was in school, anyhow. But, and uh, we, we incorporated a lot of the ideas that, that we got uh, uh, from teenagers. Yeah. Do you think that... Um distracted driving um, is still a problem in Pennsylvania? It's always going to be a problem, no matter what law you write. legislation coming? Yeah, it's like the 55 mile an hour speed yeah. limit. That was the most disobeyed law in the history of Pennsylvania. Everybody voted with their right foot, and they certainly didn't vote for 55. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that was something that, that, that Jimmy Carter put in and as a, quote, gas savings measure. And, uh, it, it's just unenforceable. And uh, if you do, it's selective enforcement because everybody was breaking the law. Th those kind of laws are are uh, are, are just different. Mm -hmm. um, but we wrote we wrote really meaningful legislation and an awful lot of it. And uh, out of all the bills I passed, the recent one, the the, the public private partnership, yes. is an immense piece of legislation. Uh, it took uh, a long time, over 12 years, to finally have the power of the idea get signed into law and I think it's going to be an unbelievable home run for the state of Pennsylvania yeah. just as has been for Virginia. Virginia just opened up by the way 
as we're recording this yesterday, they opened up the northern lanes uh, on 495. Uh, that was a $2 billion plus project. The, uh, the money that was spent on that project, one project is greater than the whole construction budget in Pennsylvania. Wow. So we, we think that the, those kind of projects will be home runs in Pennsylvania. Nice. Do you think that the, the federal government um, benefits or impedes legislation when it comes to Pennsylvania roads? The federal government uh, has a lot of rules and regulations for all the modalities. Okay. If they're providing the money, okay, the rules we live by. But if they're not providing the money and we still have to live by the rules which jack up cost, uh, I think the best thing that we can do is say stand aside, let us do it ourselves. And Pennsylvania had a rich history of transportation funding from the colonial times. Today we have, as a percentage of our gross state product, we spend less on transportation uh, than ever in the history of the state. Um, in some places, uh, our roads, we look like third world country. Uh, we're in bad shape. Yeah. Um, did you ever find the legislation process frustrating? It is. It's designed to be frustrating so you don't rush to judgment, you don't make really bad decisions, and you can reach consensus. The system was never designed to be perfect. It was designed to be imperfect. If we wanted it to be perfect, they would have made the governor a dictator. Uh, and the, the Penn family certainly could have done that, uh, but they didn't. And uh, uh, the whole idea of the General Assembly is, is wonderful. I mean, it's an absolutely wonderful concept. And you wonder how brilliant, how brilliant were those people when they came up with it? Yeah. You know, we got a bunch of people in, in that time that you got a king, you got laws, we're out of here. They left Europe and uh, they came here for religious freedom like our church and for others. And, um, that, that they could send their best and brightest uh, to Independence Hall is a pretty amazing, amazing concept. Yeah. Amazing. Big difference between being in the majority than the minority? No, it's a huge difference when you control the agenda. Um, but other than that, in transportation, you have to work with both sides. And mm -hmm. I believe that, uh, that to be bipartisan is, is the only way to go. There's no Republican or Democratic road in Pennsylvania. They're all Pennsylvania highways. Yeah. Um, earlier, you had mentioned that um, being in the House when you were first elected is a lot different than it is now. Um, specifically, would you say that the, the camaraderie among the members is different? You, in it's order to across the aisle. That's correct. In order to be, to reach consensus, you have to know each other. Mm -hmm. And if you're on the average in six years right now, that, like we are, you, know, you don't get that. Yeah. How many terms does it take you to be able to read a budget? and understand it. I mean, you end up with a house that you don't have any control of and special interests have a lot better chance of controlling and powerful staff members uh, have too much control. It wasn't like that when I came in. Yeah, I think public opinion is that there's hardly any bipartisanship. Well, we, we had great bipartisanship on public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had it on uh, the, the bills that we passed uh, on agricultural transportation this time. We had four of them. We moved two in the Senate, two in the House, well orchestrated. Uh, stuff that was teething ring issues that ended up passing both bodies without debate. And I, I consider that to be absolutely wonderful legislative engineering. And, uh, you know, it's, it makes you puff up your chest, but nobody even knows what you did. Right. <laughs> Was there a typical session day? Uh, every day was different. When I first came down, Mondays were ceremonial day. Tuesdays and Wednesdays were voting days. Thursday was committee day. And it worked out extremely well. And then uh, we got about the business of uh, uh, lately of uh, changing the rules, quote unquote, uh, reform, only to find out that it wasn't really reform. Uh, you put yourself at a disadvantage, and if there's one suggestion I would make to the House right now is to get rid of the 24-hour rule, uh, go to the Senate rules, and don't amend on second consideration, amend on third. Uh, you have to make the process work, and that's what it was designed to do. 
And we have guys who set that up that were much more brilliant than me. I have a room temperature IQ, but these guys, the guys that developed it were really, truly brilliant. Yeah. Um, would you say that most of the work is done in the committees then? Yeah, the real power of our system and the brilliance of it is the committee system. Uh, everybody sitting in a bar stool is a know-it-all. Uh, but when you actually get faced with doing something and doing it right, you need to really work it through in the committee system. Yeah. What's the hardest thing about being a representative? Uh, the amount of time that you don't have. It's, it's, it's extremely frustrating. Uh, your level of frustration you learn to live with, you don't even know you have it. Mm -hmm. And I, it was a month after uh, I lost my primary that all of a sudden I felt it go. I mean, it was like I felt it go. Yeah. And I've talked to other members who have been here for a long time, and it's been the same with them. And uh, one of my best friends has been counseling me since the election. And uh, just about everything he told me is dead truth. Yeah. Um, is it hard to to relay information about what you've been doing in Harrisburg um, to the people in your district? It's extremely hard. And with the internet, uh, with all the attacks, you get the constant special interest groups, uh, former people that work for the House who are now out as attack agents, and it makes the job that much harder. Sure. I mean, we have some people who absolutely thrive on hate and have no understanding of government. They just have their own acts and you know, they just want to come and cut the place apart. Mm. I'm an institutionalist. I believe in the General Assembly. I have a huge belief in it. Uh, it's the best system ever, ever devised on the face of this earth. And when you get former staffers who were PR writers that go out and make a lot of money uh, cutting and condemning the place, it's, it's wrong. Yeah. And I, I just I wish you would fight back. Did you have a good relationship with the media, both here in Harrisburg and I had, in your district? Uh, yeah, I, I've never really had a bad problem with the media. I, I, I will tell you, some of the people in the media became very good friends. Uh, uh, there's nobody like Al Neary, and Al and I became very good friends. And I, I would visit Al in the, in the home. Uh, he, nobody should have the jokers dealt off the bottom of the deck that he did. And I, I would go visit him, and I wouldn't be right for days. And, uh, you know, he's a wonderful wife and a wonderful daughter who's a brilliant kid. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I saw some compassion. Tony Romeo visited him every day, uh. you know, KYW. And, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, uh, good friends. I had friends that I, in the media, that I kidded a lot. I always kidded Brad Bumstead about being a liberal and carrying Jane Fonda's photograph in his wallet. Uh, there are, there are some people in the media, like people in the General Assembly, that are not good. And I've watched them passing through, and I've watched them with their agendas, and I just shake my head. And, and you hope the institution can withstand it. We touched a little bit on, on some of the changes um, that have been happening in the House, like the Internet. Um, were you in favor of, of the various technological advances within the house, the laptops on the desks, PCN, oh, I, I think that, I think, that I think that's great. I think PCN uh, in some ways is one of the biggest mistakes ever because the minute the cameras were turned on, we all of a sudden had the PCN stars. Yeah. Um, and you, you lost a lot of meaningful debate. And uh, I have no idea how to control that. Uh, maybe in the rules we should change it and have floor managers for bills allotted so much time e each uh -huh. and they pick the people that speak on it. And then if you want to get up and talk to the cameras, you can have special rules of order and uh, when you're not on the floor and let people stand up there and talk all they want to PCN. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned earlier when, um, when you first started um, mentors like Harry Biddle and, and Sam Hayes. Um, in your later years... Well, Dan Barron was the other one. Okay. Yeah, um, phenomenal did, guy. Did you see yourself as a mentor to Yeah, any I, of the I really ones? did. I, um, I helped a whole gaggle of, of representatives. And um, we gave an lot of them legislation that they could claim as their own. And, and uh, I felt awfully good doing it. Yeah. I paid back a little bit. It was given to me. Good. What would you say is or was your, your favorite part? of being a legislator? Well, the camaraderie. 
the sense of collegiality. You'll, there's no way to ever explain that. The conversations that you have with seatmates. Merle Phillips was my seatmate for 31 years. Wow. And, uh, he had a wonderful Pennsylvania uh, Dutch sense of humor. And my background, it was, uh, it was a good fit. And uh, uh, I really enjoyed Merle and, and, and uh, our friendship. And uh, yeah, you, you, I've gotten to know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of really good people. Yeah. Very few bad ones. Very few. And when you serve for a long time, everybody knows who the rotten apples are. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Is there a fondest memory? Oh, I have thousands of them. I, I will leave here with uh, uh, a whole fouling cabinet full. And you know, I, I've been talking about writing my book, and I, I talked about that in my remarks. It's going to be called Call the Caucus. And on the outside of it will be a, a disclaimer that will say many of the stories in here are dead truth. Some are outright lies, and some are in between. <laughs> You're just going to have to you know, read it and find out. And everybody has been asking me since I made those remarks, am I in the book? Am I in the book? <laughs> and uh, I keep telling everybody, you're in the book. So, I mean, there'll be a lot of people paying me not to write it. Sure. <laughs> um, will you keep busy in your retirement? I'm going to hang out a shingle and go back to transportation consulting and uh, packaging projects and uh, actually try to package some P3 projects and uh, some really good ones. And people have come to me already. Uh, we'll see if it's lucrative. Uh, if not, I'm not going to work the 78-hour work weeks that I did before. Uh, but I, I like it. I love it. And, and uh, uh, I feel i got too much juice left to give it up. Yeah. What do you think is the, the hardest issue or the biggest issue um, in front of the legislature today? I think it's transportation, yeah. pure and simple. Mm -hmm. You can't have 5,000 deficient bridges and getting worse every day. You can't have 8,000 miles of highway that must be rebuilt. You haven't touched any new um, congestion mitigation projects statewide. Uh, you're, you have airports that need tremendous amount of work, mass transit, especially capital projects, and they're not being funded by the feds, so the state has to do it. And you need a governor that leads. And I think the votes are in the House, and I think the votes are in the Senate. Uh, to pass the TFAC report that the governor had commissioned. Hmm. Do you have any regrets? Well, I, yeah, I, I have regrets. I mean, there were, there were, uh, my, I'm, I really truly am going through a remorse about not being here this next term hmm. to lead the floor fight for transportation. And I, I've done that for three of the revenue packages, and I wanted to do it for the fourth and then actually leave midterm. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I hit 100% in the pension plan and, and all that stuff. So the only reason you're staying is because you, you have a will to get the job done. Yeah. And you don't want to walk away with it being unfinished. And I think that's the German in me. <laughs> Do you think you'll run again? Oh, heck no. I, uh, I, uh, I've served my time and I've done the very best job I could possibly do. I, I don't think anybody has ever thrown himself into the job as hard as I have. And I know that's been at the, at the expense of my family and, and others. And, uh, I don't think I ever spent a full week on vacation until last year. Uh, mm. There was always so much going on. And transportation is an unbelievably busy committee. And the chairman's on uh, eight boards or commissions, including, including the State Transportation Commission. And if you're going to do the job and do it right, you've got to be in there. And I'm blessed. I've had great staff. Uh, uh, Greg Grass and, and Eric Bugale and, and others who are now with me are phenomenal guys. Uh, we did so much heavy lifting over this last term, especially after I knew I wasn't coming back. We wanted to get a lot of the stuff finished that would have carried over, and we did that uh, very successfully. How would you like your tenure as a representative to be remembered? You did the very best job you could for the people in this district. Your district comes first. If you don't deliver for your district, if there's a pot of money there and, and uh, you're philosophically against it, you can't be that way. You're a representative. You've got to go after what's best for your district. And we're electing a lot of people right now that are, uh, that are not in tune with the representative government. They represent only themselves, and they represent a special interest group that's against everything. And you cannot govern that way. 
there is no way in the world you can sign a no tax pledge and then say that you represent your district because you never know what's going to come up. I mean, you cannot be against everything and still be for something. My final question to you is what advice do you have for someone who is interested in running for public office? Uh, never take a drink. Never say anything that you shouldn't. It's recorded. Uh, the methodology today of destroying people is just unbelievable. Uh, I had a, a, a yard sign and, and, and mailers done against me that I would never believe could ever happen. A uh, picture of a dog going to the bathroom and, and the and the sign says uh, 33 years of Rick Geist is enough and then having your photograph in the pile of the dog do, I mean that's just, you know, that kind of politics is with no disclaimer. Uh -huh. uh, having outside groups that spend a fortune uh, on negative campaigning uh, and never about an issue. Uh, to send all those mailers out about the compensation of the package of the House of Representatives has nothing to do with governing. Nothing. And, uh, you know, both sides have been good at it. But what are we getting? I mean, what do you get as a legislator? You ask the question. I would like to recruit people that have a business background, who have governed within the private sector to come in here. I think it seasons them and gets them ready for this place. But when you're a young kid, you've lived in the basement of your parents' home, and you run and, you know, you put your name up with a special interest group that's nothing but attack, and then you get elected and you come in here, you're totally dysfunctional. You're totally dysfunctional. And then you become a tool of the people that put you here. And that's not what this system was designed to be. Never was, never will be. And uh, I would believe that the House needs to correct that equilibrium and go on to be what it's been for the oldest, the oldest of state houses in the country. Biggest mistake we ever made as a state house was creating the Senate. <laughs> Little humor. Yes. And on that note, Representative Geist, I want to thank you very much for sharing your stories with me. Oh, and we could do this for days of these. Sure, sure we can. Um, I wish you nothing but luck in your retirement. Well, when I write the book, buy a copy. I will. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.